we got to put the right talent in the right spot. Business of Architecture, Episode 352. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's step-by-step program for firm owners that helps you structure your practice for creative and financial success, both for you and your team. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today, I speak with the managing partner of Page's office based in Houston, Texas. Page is a multidisciplinary firm with nine offices around the world, a large firm. Previous to his position with Page, Mr. Chavez led design teams at CRS and HOK. My guest today is architect Arturo Chavez, and today we speak about the key to leadership, working with people, and how to create an organization that performs at its best. Art, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you, Enoch. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invite. It really is a pleasure to have you. I'd love for our, our listeners and for myself to understand, what are your job responsibilities at PAGE? Well, as uh, the managing principal of the Houston office um, and and the uh, Mexico City office, uh, I have the, those regional responsibilities in running an office and working with our thought leadership and our market sector leadership uh, in marketing and business development, um, certainly working on the operational side, the financial side. So it's, it encompasses running an office, um, HR issues. So there's administrative management issues. Um, operational issues, financial issues. So it's the full gamut now in, in my position. But also because we work very closely across the firm in, in leading the entire firm, I also have these um, what we call cor- corporate-wide or firm-wide responsibilities. So I'm responsible for marketing, um, responsible for the building sciences component of our business, which includes sustainability, you know, lead, the wellness and a lot of other, you know, building research uh, uh, aspects of the firm. Um, and so I'm um, also um, uh, am over the corporate commercial market. So we've found that uh, it's good to have uh, access to the board, to senior principals. And so markets, practices, and services have access to uh, and a relationship, a channel, if you will, to a senior principal. Uh, and that helps, you know, lubricate this big machine. Art, right, you mentioned that one of your stewardships is the building sciences. I, I'm I'm interested to know how much into the technical aspects of that you get because it sounds like you have a lot on your plate as a managing principal. I do not get that far into it. I'm going to be completely honest. That this is why we have. Uh, focused on recruiting and retaining some really key people across the firm, uh, architecture and engineering. It's, it's a, it's a team effort. And so, uh, Jill Kurtz, uh, is, is the director of our building sciences and brings a tremendous amount of, uh, experience, talent, and most of all passion around this. And so, uh, uh, my role, uh, as it relates to the building sciences, it relates to any of our departments, studios, uh, disciplines, practices is to, um, you know, uh, help, help kind of pave the way and, uh, get, uh, any, any hurdle, any hindrances, things that sort of get in the way of progress and, and development of those groups and kind of clear the path a little bit, you know? Um, so, uh, I've moved away. I was a designer. I grew up in the in 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 architecture as a designer, and uh, but have slowly, uh, slowly over time migrated towards the management and then really more business development and marketing. You know, and so that's been sort of my path. And along the way, you know, you kind of learn. It's like, wow, that that person does it better than me. Let me get out of the way so they could really perform. Art, you guys have been able to recruit just an exceptional team at page and i know that's very important to you is recruiting the very best people out there what do you feel is the secret to getting great talent who want to stay i uh i think it's the culture uh at our office at the firm um and um 
I think it's one that uh, rewards and embraces uh, talent and skill, but more importantly, uh, embraces and uh, your voice, you know, and uh, we have, uh, uh, we have so we have so much talent in various areas of the firm in various parts of the delivery process er, from early, early programming and planning to commissioning uh, into the job. And then um, everybody has a voice. Everybody, you have to develop a culture where people feel they have a voice. And that culture is also one, when you have a culture of sustainability, not sustainability as it relates to design, but, you know, lead or anything. It's more about if we're all thinking that we want the firm to be sustainable. We're 125 years old. You know, we started in 1898. We want it to be, we want it to continue to grow and continue to, we wanted to be around another 125 years. So what, what, what is that? What mindset does that put someone in? Puts you in the sort of a mentor, coaching, professorial role where you're, you, you embrace teaching, you embrace team, uh, all these sort of words that define a culture that people gravitate to, you know? And, uh, you know, corporate culture can be tough can be harsh Um, it could be dismissive and uh, once you realize that you know um, you need a village you know and you start to really uh, approach your recruiting strategies very differently you know and so uh, uh, we all want more or less more or less the same thing you know in terms of we want to we want to kind of go home with our daily bread. You know, we want to have daily value. We want to feel like we contributed. And the only way to feel that way is to have a, to allow that engagement to happen. And it's two way. And so having a voice, being heard, you know, um, and um, I think people gravitate to environments like that. So. Art, I remember a story once of a friend of mine who was working at an architecture firm, and and he told me that the principal, there were two of them, were, were quite temperamental. And, uh, you know, they had particular ideas about the way they wanted the designs done, or maybe they, they had short tempers. They felt like no one ever really listened. People were making the same mistakes over and over again. And so there was, it was very heightened kind of emotional atmosphere there at that firm. And in addition the principals never really embraced the voice of their staff, as you mentioned, and kind of took credit for everything good that was happening. But then anything bad happened, it's sort of like, well, my team must have done something wrong. You know, I'm going to, going to fix that. How, which in, in terms of your approach to leadership, if we take that up as a bad example, what would you say are the keys to actually making a culture where people want to stay? Cause let's face it, they might stay there cause they need the pay, but I can't imagine someone would stay at an office like that out of, because they love it. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, and Nick, you and I have both heard and many people have heard those horror stories of, uh, those experiences and they still exist. Um, um, and there's so many ways to sort of tackle this question, but, um, I, I just, you got to know as, as an employee or as someone that's applying for a job somewhere, um, and you, you know, if you have to really sort of, uh, try to ask those right questions to try to, uh, try to understand what the culture in this place is. Most of the places like the one you just described, you kind of know about them already, right? Ahead of time. So a lot of students or new recruits, or going into those because eh, they respect the work, they like the quality of the work. They may not get a sense of what the culture is like, but they're going to do it anyway because the work is great, it's fantastic, and it's getting recognized. Uh, the process by which it gets done is not appealing at all, and some hold their nose and do it anyway, right? And um, but reality is, I think that. Um, it bores me. It agitates me that people that we act that way in in our industry, and uh, 
this business is not a one person business. It takes a team uh, more so now than ever before, before, Look, you were an architect and you worked with the craftsmen and you designed it and you did it. You were the guy who was all in your head and you kind of did it. Well, it's different now, right? It's manufacturing is different. Construction is different. It's a team approach. Clients are different, you know, and, um, and talent, talent is, uh, it's hard to recruit. I mean, it's, it's not easy, you know, because, um, uh, they, they have a particular, image a particular sort of perspective on the environments that they want to work. And again, I mean, for me, it's, it's the dialogue. You got to have dialogue with your talent, with your thought leadership. You have to have a relationship with your talent and your leadership, all of your staff, all of your staff, you have to develop. HR is not an easy deal. If you're actually practicing HR, right? I don't manage projects. I manage people. People deal with the projects. Okay. I've, I don't, I don't, I don't manage projects. I never have. I never have my entire life. I manage people. I manage our people, you know? Um, and I've always said, <laughs> this is kind of, it's kind of a goofy deal, but there's kind of a, it's a, it's a very basic, um, thought that I've had from the very beginning uh, for a while now. So what you don't want to do is when you have, when you find talent and most, when you find that sort of, when you find talent, they're motivated. They have tremendous discipline and tremendous rigor. They're very passionate about what they do. You, do, you don't have to motivate them per se. What you have to be careful with is not to demotivate them. You know, so what demotivates people? Well, mm, poor technology, you know, a, sh a crappy computer, a crappy laptop. And you go, well, <laughs> what does that cost you? It costs nothing compared to the loss of time, of passion, of the great idea. You know, you, people get frustrated with that. What's another one? Another one is when you hold on to underperformers, you know, you have someone who's doing really spectacular and you sit them next to somebody that's not doing so well. Um, and that person's having to make up the slack. That's a demotivator, you know? And so, or you reward somebody, <laughs> you know, you reward the wrong person or you're, or you're not being fair to one who's really doing the work. So this is, this is where this relationship comes into play. Being connected with your people is very important. So you understand what's really happening down in the trenches. You know, uh, it's an architecture firm. It's not like, you know, it's, you know, they're all professionals, you know, I mean, you get, we, we got to change this mindset. There's, it's not, oh, it's not just an intern. It's not just a, a the newbie. It's not just a new hire. It's a professional. They went to five years of school. It's a professional, you know, they may not be licensed yet, but guess what? They're an adult and they're a professional. When can we instill this professionalism back into our profession, you know, and start to nurture the dialogue with our employees and everyone in a firm, you know, that's centered around kind of respect and courtesy and, and doing great work. Focusing in on the real challenge of doing great work. You know, we've lost a lot of momentum with clients because we've, like, in my mind, we've kind of uh, lost our credibility over the, over a few decades, you know. So instead of being really sort of strong professionals around what we bring and nurturing talent and teaching and mentoring talent to make sure that we do great work and our project sets look amazing and they're constructible and the contractors are saying thumbs up on, on the quality of them. I think you've heard there's, you know, contractors get frustrated with the quality of the documents out there and they guess what they go tell the clients and, you know, and you lose credibility. And I think that all goes back to just poor communication with your staff, you know, developing better dialogue, you know, and making sure your staff feels like they're plugged in. Got it. Got it. 
So Art, as a managing principal of the Houston office and also the Mexico City office, what do you find is on your mind the most in that position? Well, you know, there's that saying that, you know, as a service firm, uh, architects, we're always, we're always going out of business, you know, because you're always working towards uh, the finale, right? And you're always to, the, to, the fine, to, to terminate the project. You're, re- you're, you're working on a project and it's coming to an end. So you need another project, you know, and uh, so I think as you know for sure it's always it's always going to be the pipeline of work. It's always going to be the backlog of work. You know, that's definitely one. But uh, for many reasons, you know, we've we've made commitments to our employees, you know, to their families, and we you know to work hard to keep them employed, you know, and so uh, that's that's always the number one thing is like making sure that we've got. Um, that we have that pipeline of work. So yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that comes along with that, right? You know, does, position. Does that, does, just, does that buck stop with you, Art? Meaning that are you the ultimately the person who's making sure that the pipeline is consistent, flow, right projects, et cetera? No, no, no. We've we we have uh, an amazing uh, group on the leadership side. Our principals, uh, our principals are out there. They're doer sellers. Okay. Um, most of them, most of them are. So no, it's it's not just a burden I carry. I mean, they, we we all carry it. And we're all uh, very committed to to it, you know. And uh, and you know, it's it's a commitment to we made to each other, to our staff, and our staff relies on us to to be out there working hard to win more work and bring in more work. You know, um, yeah. So. You brought you brought up the distinction about the seller doer model. So talked about the other principles being seller doers. Mm-hmm. Do you think is that a skill that either you're born with it and you're not, or you're not, or is it something that can be learned? I think it could be learned. Um, I think it could absolutely be learned, but you have to. Uh, the firm has to build it a chassis, if you will, an infrastructure that allows that learning to happen, right? And so um, you may have a thought leader that may not be very accustomed to selling. And so you may have to prop that person up with an additional person, someone that can help, someone that can assist um, on the business development side and pull that person into uh, conversations, interviews, discussions, presentations, seminars, you know, that, that are really more part of the business development and marketing side, you know, and, and slowly, you know, you, you see this all the time. I mean, the, the, those type of folks eventually see the, you know, the, the, the power of that, you know, and how effective it is. And, uh, I think, I think many of us, you know, uh, kind of have that mentoring coaching want to talk about what we do side of us right that we want to we definitely want to kind of talk about our experience and what we do and when and how well we do it and so uh, you may not know how to sell it you may not know how to position it but uh, we have folks in the office that do and so we we look for those thought leaders that are more doers and we have them participate on the seller side you know, now you don't want to do too much of that. You know, sometimes doers are just very strong doers and, and yeah, pull me out. I'll go knock on a door. I'll go do an interview, but I got to get back to the boards. I got to get back to my team. And, you know, we respect that too, you know, because there's a benefit there too, of course, you know, so, but it's, again, these are all things that you can't do if you're not connected, if you're not connected to your, to your folks yeah. and really kind of understand, yeah. you know, what they're after. So, um, yeah. You know. Earlier you, you, you mentioned that one of your primary focuses is marketing. If I heard you correctly mm-hmm. for you, what does that entail? Well, for me, um, it is ensuring that the infrastructure, the resources are there for, our thought leadership. Um, we are in a variety of markets. And so there's an operational side to marketing that has to be there. Someone calls, they need, a, you know, someone has an opportunity, a lead on a project. 
we um, a proposal needs to be done, a presentation needs to be done, a brochure needs to be created, a uh, specific uh, thought leadership piece needs to be created. So the marketing operational side uh, is there to support those efforts. Um, in addition, it's it's also um, a, sort of an infrastructure that is there to communicate to everybody strategies, implementation of strategies, how we're doing, updates on those strategies. So um, it's uh, and the makeup and the makeup of the market sector itself. You know, making sure that uh, those functions are working, our thought leaders and our market manager. Uh, within within each of the markets, um, um, need need that support from the marketing operations side. So it's it's uh, sounds complicated, but maybe not. It's it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we developed years ago sort of a central services uh, component to our firm. It's almost uh, like a firm within a firm. And um, the central services is made up of all of our marketing staff. Which and we're talking marketing managers, marketing you know coordinators, um, accounting, IT, and HR. So marketing central services is really a virtual studio that spans all the offices, and they support the entire firm. Yeah, so, so it's a resource everyone can everyone can call upon. Yeah, yeah, and the other firms are have that same setup too. It's not like we created it, you know, but it. it it's a system that really you can take works. Take credit for it. I won't tell anyone. We'll, we'll take credit for it. <laughs> I will take credit for. We will take credit for probably making it better than anybody else's. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. There's this is one. Uh, our our director of uh, central services marketing is John Kletzner, and he he does a phenomenal job with that team. Again, it mm. goes back to people. You, it's I don't do this. You know. I mean, yeah. I. It's like I, I, my talent, I always say this in interviews, I, I, I'll gloat about people and say, this person is this, like, and Nick is like amazing. He's going to, he's going to come up with some things and you're going to be t- totally overwhelmed by him. And I go to the next person, the next person, and certainly describe them the best way I can. And because I know them yep. and then I introduced myself and I said, look, my only talent is that I know how to find talent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my only talent. I'm just, I'm just here to carry the projector, you know. Well, the funny thing is, people that don't know the importance of that statement say they might kind of poo-poo that, but someone who really knows, they put you in charge of the office. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Which they did. <laughs> yeah, that happened. <laughs> so, where, where does the let's face it, working with teams, and this has been a theme that you've talked about, Art. I know that it's, it's near and dear to your heart. You've mentioned uh, that that you've always been involved with the people side of the business. Is this something that came naturally to you? Were you just the guy that everyone liked in, in high school and elementary school and you just kind of love people? Did you get it from your parents? Where did you get these skills to work with people? I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's ever asked me that, but uh, I, uh, I'm a pretty friendly guy and I'm, and I'm a very, um, you know, unselfish. Um, I'm not, uh, I love to see people prosper. I love to see people succeed. And, um, and I want to say that I have very good awareness. Um, we always have to work on awareness, but I, I sense I have very good awareness. And so when I came over as design director, if you will, when I was design director for the Page Houston office, started recruiting people. Um, and, you know, there's that awareness of like, well, how, how do we grow this? You know, and, uh, we got to put the right talent in the right spot, and and the folks I was hiring, they were much better than me. <laughs> it's like I got to get out of their way, you know. Uh, now think about what some of these other guys, some of these other folks that maybe don't think that way, say, no, 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 no. I'm still designed a director. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and it's and so you start to squash that talent in many ways, or you don't utilize it the way you should, you know. Yeah, and so uh, I think in a lot of ways the firm's role is to, you know, we've discussed this at our firm. Firm's role is to do your best you can to find all the the, the talent throughout the firm and put it in play, you know, and allow it to, and allow it put it in play, you know, 
and uh, that's why I say HR is not HR. If you're doing HR, you're correctly. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah, you know, yeah. That easy. So um, yeah. anyway, I'm super excited about where we are as a firm. Um, there's a tremendous amount of dialogue across the leadership, the principals, and the senior principals. We just came off of a three-day virtual retreat where we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, um, communication and dialogue. And we've, we have, you know, I was talking about awareness earlier. We had all of our leadership take an emotional intelligence assessment, you know, and everyone's uh, really uh, taking that serious and looking at introspectively and trying to understand, you know, our, our individual relationships with our team and how do we become better leaders for our team? And a lot of it starts with the communication uh, across the leadership to coordinate those efforts of, of all of our staff that we do, everything we do. Yeah. And has that been something that you've invested in personally, maybe attending seminars, learning how to communicate better, or is it just, Art's always been a great communicator and he just learns as he goes and, no, no, no. I mean, I, you know, certainly learned and, and read different things. And uh, I, you know, a few years ago, I spent a year um, in sort of once, once a month classes and uh, a few other, um, like a couple of retreats. And uh, it was with the American Leadership Forum. I don't know if you've heard of American Leadership Forum. They have a few chapters around the country. And in essence, American Leadership Forum um, was created to bring community leaders together, whether they're CEOs, private or non, not-for-profit uh, directors, um, bring them together uh, to create relationships through dialogue through communication, through relationships. And I always felt that I was a pretty good communicator with my folks and everybody else. And I, But this American Leadership Forum sort of taught me that, wow, there's a lot more to discover around communication. It's kind of like you and I right now. We're, we're playing two parts, right? And we switch those parts. You you. If we felt, if we all felt an accountability around listening to the person and an accountability to reacting and coming back with a response to what we heard, you know, that's the role we should be playing. It, your relationships change. Your relationship with your employee change. It's no longer just a Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So you don't like the way that works. All right. Well, I'll look into it. All right. No, it becomes, ah, you see a problem. You came to talk to me about this problem. It must be significant. I need to, I need to look into this and I owe you a response, you know? So it's, it's, it's quite different. So I, I think those are the things that we're exploring in our organization is better communication, much better communication. Um, and, um, uh, it's dialogue. It's dialogue. Having dialogue with your with everyone across the firm is very important. The top keys for better dialogue, better communication. What would you say? I think the first one is is self awareness. You know, I mean, you, you have to kind of you have to do some soul searching. You have to look in the mirror, and you have to sort of understand what's what's your personality. What's your sort of um, what's your own sort of uh, emotional awareness? Where's your empathy? You know, uh, where's, you know, how do you process things? You know, am I, am I giving enough room for dialogue? Am I giving enough, enough room for this person? Am I giving enough room for that person? Um, how do I process what I'm hearing? You know, and I think there's a, there's a lot of sort of, you know, looking in the mirror, you know, and, and doing a really good self analysis and saying, am I, Am I doing what I can? Am I doing my part? You know, um, and um, and then I, this, the second is just uh, you know creating that environment where you know your staff and everyone knows that it's an open door. 
I don't have an enclosed office. I've like forbidden to be in an enclosed office. Like I have a, I have a desk like anybody else. My space is a little bit bigger because it does have a couch. People come and talk to me and we sort out issues and, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's more therapy for me than anybody else. The couch. I was about to say, who's, who's on the couch, the, uh, the employer, you, <laughs> I feel like I am, yeah. but, uh, but no, I, I, you know, I, I, it's open and I want people to come in as they walk by, as they're going to get a coffee or they're walking to see somebody else. I mean, it, I've never been in a, in an enclosed office, you know, and, um, I want it open. I want it accessible. And, uh, and that's been something that I've always carried with me my whole, uh, life. Uh, the, the principles that I used to work for years back, uh, worked in an open office and I had a relationship with them, you know, and it worked and it worked. So, uh, I always told, I taught at university of Houston for several years and they'd ask me, so what firm would you work for? I said, well, any of them, as long as the boss isn't in an office, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Good. But, well, I think that's a great place to uh, leave our conversation for today. Yeah. Art Chavez, thank you for joining us here on the business of architecture. Thank you very much. Jenny. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.